Hello everybody, welcome to the Boxing Science Podcast. This is episode 50, where we're going to be answering your questions around different subjects regarding sports science and performance in boxing and combat sports. In this episode, we've got a range of different questions, mostly around programming. How to program over a long period of time, let's say over 16 weeks, how to push the body without overtraining. Also how to manage programming around amateur competitions. So like if you're heading towards amateur championships, this is really important for you. And also how to program in the off season, or even if you're on vacation. Also in this episode, I'm gonna be talking about how to improve your boxing specific fitness, and also how to train heavyweight boxers. So the first question is from Sesh1113. How do you go about programming conditioning for a fighter that has 16 weeks out until their next fight or tournament without burning them out? So this is a really important question. If you've got the fortunate situation where you've got a long training camp, so I'd say a long training camp is anything above 10 weeks. The reason why you're so fortunate is because you've got enough time to work on a range of different adaptations. But what's really important is that you're applying progressive overload without overtraining, overreaching, and making sure that you're peaking for the more intense parts of training camp, so sparring just before the fight or tournament, but then also peaking for the actual competition itself. So in terms of conditioning, what you want to do is focus on different adaptations. So we've got our three pillar approach. We've got central adaptations, which is red zone conditioning. We've got peripheral adaptations, which is extracting, utilizing oxygen of the muscle. So that's our 30 second max out sprints. And then we've got muscle buffering, improving the muscle's ability to control acidosis. So controlling your lactic acid production. In any training program, we'd select each modality based on what the athlete is needing to work on and also the length of training camp. When we've got a very short training camp, we primarily do the peripheral adaptations and muscle buffering. And the reason why is because the amount of sessions that you need and the amount of training weeks that you need for a significant change in performance is a lot less than central adaptations. So you're getting more bang for your buck when you're doing 30 second max out sprints or our repeated sprint training. With central adaptations, because our boxers are one, very red zone dominant in their boxing training, and two, the time for adaptation is around about six to eight weeks. The actual time for change is longer, but the amount of change is very small. So we're only improving our performance by what, five or 10%, whereas in our peripheral adaptations and muscle buffering adaptations, we might see anything between 10 and 20% changes. So we're getting bigger changes in short amount of time with our sprint training and our muscle buffering conditioning. So when we're talking about a 16 week training camp, we might have more time to work on red zone adaptations. So we've got that six to eight weeks at the start of training camp before we then start to intensify our training and go for maximum sprints. So if I've got a longer time with an athlete, that gives me a really good opportunity to then work on central adaptations. Whereas like in most of our training camps that are quite small, between eight and 10 weeks, I'm just looking to muscle buffering and the piffle adaptations. What's really important in this as well is to make sure that you're managing the volume and intensity to have loading weeks and have deload weeks. So you're pushing the body and then allowing it to recover. So we follow at Boxing Science a three to one deload strategy where we're doing medium, medium, heavy, a really heavy week preceded by a lighter deload week. And this way, we're progressing our athletes to promote adaptation, but then we're allowing the body to recover. And this has been shown to be really effective in improving physical performance without overtraining in well-trained cyclists. This is what we've been following at Boxing Science for many years. And the way that you do this is just manipulating the volume and intensity. So if we're doing four minutes on, two minutes off, in the first week, we'd be doing four reps. In the next week, we'd be doing five reps. And then the third week, the heavy week, might be doing five reps at a faster speed or might be increasing the volume to six reps. So to summarize how we'd manage a 16 week training camp in basic conditioning, we'd be using it as a, a really good opportunity to be working on red zone conditioning, central adaptations for a long amount of time, build up that base level fitness and then really intensify training with around 10 weeks ago with our 30 second max out sprints. 
So a question from UCL1167. Hey, love your videos. Thank you very much. My question is that I'm a fast, slick fighter with fast hands, fast feet, but seem to get a lot of muscle fatigue and tired fast. Is there a specific exercise or workout I can do to improve my stamina? So when I'm working with athletes for the first time, we take them through the boxing science testing battery. Part of this, we do our physiological assessment. We take them through a lactate profile and a 30 second wing gate assessment. And from this, I can see what physical capabilities that they have and what they might need to work on. You know, are they more endurance-based athlete? Are they more sprint-based athlete? The sprint-based athlete is somebody with fast hands and being explosive, but might struggle repeating that explosiveness. They might end up feeling quite heavy in their arms and their legs, feeling quite fatigued later on. With these athletes, what I would do is do more peripheral adaptations, so that's our 30 second max out sprint. We also do our repeated sprint training, so 12 seconds on, 48 seconds off. This can be done on a curve or done on the assault bike. So what I'd be tempted to do with an athlete that might be struggling with them being fast and explosive under fatigue, is actually doing circuit-based conditioning. And instead of going for like a red zone adaptation, we'd be more looking for power endurance. So red zone adaptations for circuits would be like longer durations with short amount of rest. So a typical example would be 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. But our power endurance would be shorter work, let's say 10 to 15 seconds, with a longer recovery between 45 and 50 seconds. Using explosive exercises, such as sprinting on the spot, med ball slams, using the assault bike as well, burpees, stuff that is going to be really challenging, that force and speed under a fatiguing situation. Giving our athletes targets to hit a certain amount of reps in that time, and this will really challenge that power endurance. So we've just recently done a video with Jordan Flynn that is actually training this, and we're giving him targets, we're taking his lactate, and we're actually showing that we're replicating the demands of a normal muscle buffering session in a circuit-based format. So if you haven't watched this yet, Go check out the video, the link is in the description. So a question from KA10299. How to maintain strength and conditioning during the national championships when fighting every weekend after each other? So this is really vital for amateur boxing to try and maintain their strength and their fitness whilst going through the championship model. So a championship model might be going through the regionals, nationals and then obviously you've got your finals where you've got your quarter final semi final and final all on the same weekend so with this you need to really plan out your training to maintain that you've got that fitness and that strength going into then final competitions so what I would do is focus on strength wise be more looking towards speed strength adaptations such as like doing plyometrics and punch specific exercises everything that fits into that taper model i would be doing like minimum effective dose this means the minimum amount of reps and sets still push them adaptations would we'll be tempted to do some isometrics in there such as like a isometric hip thrust isometric trap bar split stance deadlift maybe some isometric wrap press as well and this is to help maintain strength without creating too much fatigue or soreness going into each competition. What's really important is to actually plan out your training, know when are the key dates. So for example, if you know that you've got two weeks of training available, maybe try and step up training that week and then taper for the next one. And then also making sure that your main taper, your key taper is actually coming for the finals. Because if you taper off and peak for competition, in the first stage, it is then very hard to re-achieve that peak towards end. So if you're managing your training, of course, then first competitions are really important, but you can still achieve optimum performance without actually peaking your key physical characteristics. So plan for the end game. Deload to make sure that they are fresh for these rounds at the start, but make sure that you're actually planning your training to peak for the, the final stages of the championships at the end. In terms of conditioning, what's really good to do is to plan your training going in to be actually working on repeated sprint training. 
So you go 12 seconds on, 48 seconds off. In this way, you can do your conditioning sessions under really, really low volumes. The minimum amount of reps that I do on 12 seconds on, 48 seconds off is just 12 reps. So with that, you're creating adaptations with only doing like 12 minutes of work. And that's not really going to fatigue your athlete too much, but still maintaining, maybe even still improving and fitness adaptations. You know at Boxing Science we're very data driven, whether that's testing or training, we're always looking to optimize performance. We also take the same approach with our video content. That's why recently we've been doing a range of different content for you that's been really popular to see how we can implement Boxing Science training methods into your training environment. And part of that research, we've actually found out very interesting facts from people that watch this video. Only 32% of people that watch this video actually subscribe to the channel. So that means that a massive of 68% of you that are watching aren't actually subscribing. So I'd like to ask you a quick favor, if you could hit that subscribe button, that'll really help grow the channel so we can bring you even more content to help take your training and coaching to the next level. Okay, next question. Hector Perez, 6071. I've seen that you use resistance bands when doing landmine presses, but could it be done with just bands? What other exercises can be done with bands only? So using bands for lifting is something that we call accommodating resistance. So accommodating resistance is where we're increasing the amount of resistance towards the end range of the lift. And this is really important for boxing for a number of reasons. One, acceleration all the way through the lift, basically increasing that tension towards the end range of the punch. This can also help increase the snap and end range of the punch, so amount of tension that you create through the upper limb, core, and lower body upon impact. And also it helps us drive through that sticking point. So with boxers, we might struggle, especially on our upper body pressing, driving through that sticking point, activating our triceps. So this is gonna help improve our performance on lifting. So we normally use bands in assistance to our barbell or dumbbell lifts, but it can also be used as a, an exercise on its own. So there's a range of different exercises. We've got banded jumps, we've got band accentuated jumps, punch specific exercises. So the problem is with a landmine punch and then doing it just with bands only, you might actually be underloading your athlete. So we do like banded uppercuts where, or banded punches where we're using two bands at once, so overloading the hips with a heavier band a lighter band at the top, and then approaching that with, with speed adaptations, or maybe like doing a, an isometric hold at the end. And then for upper body, we can be doing a press up, banded press up, really effective exercise for the upper body. We can be doing band pull aparts for the posterior shoulder, or even like kind of band pulls for the upper back. And then for lunges and, and for the lower body, you can be doing like band assisted lunges, so increasing that momentum actually going in to the lunge action. So these are like some exercises that you can do. It is quite hard to just go right bands only all the time. But let's say if you're without a kit, whether you're working away or out on training camp or even on holiday, using these bands can be a great way to basically train and tick over, get some strength and some speed adaptations whilst you're not lifting weights. Maybe this is a, a future video for the Boxing Science channel where we do a band only workout to help take that into your training. Another question from Sesh113. What do you do to monitor training loads across technical conditioning and strength training sessions? That's a fantastic question because monitoring training load is really important because we want to track changes in performance. We're also needing to avoid any spikes in training load because this can have an effect on fatigue, overreaching, and increasing that likelihood of injury. So how we monitor training load is very, very simple. For our boxing sessions, we simply do duration times RPE. So we use RPE, this is a rate of perceived exertion, which is a scale of one to 10 or zero to 10. Zero being totally resting, 10 being very, very hard, maximal effort work. And what we do is basically multiply the duration of the session, so let's say 60 minutes, times the RPE, let's say 10. Making it very simple for maths, that, that gives us a training load of 600. 
And then we'd monitor that through the training week and we'd give boxers and boxing coaches some guidance on whether they've had a heavy training week, whether to have a dealer day, how to structure that dealer day as well. And I give them a target on duration and RP to make sure that they're hitting the right amount of training load. So for conditioning loads, this is a little bit more complicated than the boxing one because we've got a few different variables. We've got the duration of the rep. We've got the, the amount of reps that we do and obviously time sets as well. We've got the speed that we're running at. So that would be an average speed of the amount of reps. And then we've got RP, so rate of perceived exertion. We'd be doing four minutes times by four reps, times by a speed, maybe 16 kilometers an hour, times by the RP, which is about eight or nine out of 10. This is purely for running. There needs to be some changes in how we approach, like if we're doing it on a different modality, Let's say if we're doing it on a watt bike or a, an assault bike, obviously we'd be using watts there instead of using kilometers per hour as, as our intensity. But that's the general rule of thumb and how you'd monitor conditioning training loads. For strength training, we'd be doing reps times sets times like by the weight lifted. So if we do 100 kilos for three repetitions, that gives us a load of 300 times that by the amount of sets, let's say we do five sets, that gives us a training load of 1500. And then we'd add that up for the different amount of weights that we do. With training load management, what's really important here is to keep it really simple, but also just manage it in blocks because the difference between an athlete training in a maximum strength training block compared to a strength speed training block, they might be lifting 150 kilos on trap bar deadlift, and then in a strength speed block, they might be jumping with 50 or 60 kilos. With that in mind, the load has come down significantly, but the output is still pretty high. With that in mind, we need to make sure that we're just managing the training loads in each section to monitor them changes in volume and intensity accordingly. So a question from Victor Peralta, 9431. What are the common injuries that a boxer tends to endure? What protocols should be taken for recovery? Does having a different body type play a role in the injury or recovery? I'm enjoying your content. Much love from the US. Thank you very much, Victor. In terms of like common injuries in boxing, there's a few key areas. We've got lower body where we've potentially got some knee issues, calf issues based on like the amount of running load that they have. Lower back which is predominantly the quadratus lumborum, what we call the QL muscle, which has an effect because we're quite tight in thoracic rotation, do a lot of side bending, and this actually flares up the lower back. But the main source of injuries that I see boxers have is in the shoulder, predominantly in the lead shoulder. This tightness and instability of the lead shoulder can then end up leading to injuries in the elbow, the wrist, and also the hands. Most injured area in, in sports science research for boxers is in the hands, but mostly that I see that people have trouble with is around the shoulder and the upper limb. And the reason why is because, especially in the lead hand, is because one, we throw it very differently to our back hand. The back hand is supported with a rotation of the pelvis and the trunk, whereas like the lead hand is very arm um, dominant. Also, there's a large ratio between how often you use the lead hand rather than the back hand. Think about your combinations on a bag. You might do a jab cross, double jab cross, that's a two to one ratio. You might do a double jab cross and then a lead hook, that's a three to one ratio. And then think about what you use in between to gauge that distance to keep your opponent off. You're using that lead hand a lot more. So with that in mind, because you're using it a lot more and using it in a lot different way, this can leave the lead shoulder into a very vulnerable position. So in terms of like how to manage that, there's one, do a lot of mobility and movement work, a lot of stability work around the shoulders, in particular, looking at kind of unilateral imbalances. Strengthen the posterior shoulder cuff with exercises such as reverse flies, band pull aparts, banded triple threat, and also doing the isometric dumbbell holds, and this will help improve that strength in the posterior cuff to try and balance out that anterior and posterior dominance. And the key thing is really 
is managing training loads. So the most dangerous part of a training camp is towards the start of training camp because you go from zero, not doing any training, maybe eating, maybe drinking a little bit too much, being quite tight because you might be sat down and not as active as much. So going into straight into training camp, trying to smash the bags, trying to catch up, trying to get fit as, as quickly as possible. Now going from that zero to 100 in your mindset and in terms of your training, huge spikes in training load are the, probably the biggest contributors towards injuries. So there's a lot of data in different sports such as running and cycling and also in AFL football, which see anything above 20% increases in training load and significantly increases the likelihood of injury. At the start of training camp, there is going to be increases in training load, but it's how we manage it. So can we do training a little bit lighter? Can we use bigger gloves to reduce the impact forces on hands? Can we do only two boxing training sessions in the first week and do predominantly mobility, stability, strength and conditioning work to build up them foundations in terms of your movement and your stability before you're stepping up that load in boxing. And this is like something that is mismanaged at every single level in boxing and something that we're really wanting to do more of with our boxers at Boxing Science. So I've got a question from Egg. It looks like a profile picture of an egg as well. Egg JX7WS. What are the best ways to recover from muscle soreness, injury and fatigue during training camp? The best way to recover is managing your training. So I've just answered a question about managing injuries. Managing training load is really important. If you are becoming too sore from your training, then you might be doing a little bit too heavy, maybe doing a little bit too much work where you end up being quite sore. Also making sure that you're following up each training day with a lighter day. So at Boxing Science, we manage our training for two days on, one day lighter, two days on, one day off, and then we have our final day on a Sunday. So with that, we're pushing our body and letting it recover. So that's really important. If you are managing training load quite well, and you're wanting some tips on managing recovery, there's a few things that you can do. One is making sure that you get nutrition right. So after a training session, making sure that you're refueling effectively. So a great tip in the first like 30 minutes after a session, you want something like a drink, like a milkshake, something with a three to one carb to protein ratio. So like a bottle of Yuzu, a 500 ml bottle of Yuzu is a very effective and quick, cheap snack that you can have to help boost your recovery. Also like managing your nutrition before training to make sure that you're fueling effectively and then also managing your whole nutrition approach. Then you've got sleep. Sleep is a huge thing for recovery. People try and do the fancy things such as compression trousers or ice baths or anything like that, but they're not actually managing their sleep effectively. If you're only having five to six hours sleep a night, you're not going to recover from hard training sessions. You need to be approaching your sleep like you would do your training. So in your training, you'll be doing mobility warm-up, you'll be fueling in the right way. For your sleep, you need to be approaching that in the right way. Are you switching your phone off for an hour, two hours before you go to bed? Are you going to be in a dark room? Are you going to have a, a cool shower before you go in? These, these are all things that you can do to help improve your approach to sleep, improve the amount of sleep that you're having, and also the quality of sleep that you're having as well. And this will have a huge impact on how you're recovering from training sessions. Then doing mobility, making sure that you're on top of your mobility day in, day out. But to try and reduce soreness, the last thing that you want to do is just stay stiff and not do anything. Get your body working, get some low intensity exercise going, get some mobility, increasing that range of motion, and then this will help reduce that soreness. Doing stuff like massage gun and doing massages and everything like that, that can really help reduce that soreness as well. And then once you get the main foundations in place, start doing the fancy stuff, doing stuff like heat application. So doing sauna, doing ice bath. So doing an ice bath around about 10 degrees for between five and 10 minutes. And then you can mix the two. So you can do sauna for five minutes, do a cold plunge for 30 seconds, then back into the sauna. So hot and cold, contrast therapy, really good to improve 
recovery. And this can be done on a cycle of three or four times. So around about 30 minutes between doing the sauna and doing the ice baths. Okay guys, quick interruption again, just to tell you more about our Boxing Science Mentorship. This online mentorship has been something that we've been wanting to work towards for the last few years to help develop coaches, SNC coaches, personal trainers, maybe even athletes to help accelerate their career. If you're wanting to improve your knowledge of boxing science training methods and strength and conditioning development, if you're wanting to become a better coach, or you're wanting to elevate your profile in terms of business and social media and to get more clients, this mentorship is ideal for you. We're going to be sharing our experiences and knowledge that we've acquired over the last 10 years of developing the boxing science as a business, but also the consultancy program that has seen over hundreds of professional boxers, amateurs, all the way through to world champions. In this mentorship, we've got a range of different exclusive webinars. We've got our live Q and A's, we've got a group discussion, and also we've got packages that allow for one-to-one -one bespoke mentoring. Really passionate about this mentorship. We've put a lot into it. We're gonna be getting guest speakers and everything to give you a unique learning experience to help accelerate your career to become the best coach that you can be and also take your business to the next level. If you've got any questions about it, send me an email, dannywilson at boxingscience.co.uk or we can schedule a call where I can tell you more about the details around the Boxing Science Mentorship. So I've got a question from 007470. How to stay fit during vacation? First of all, if you only got a week off or something like that, just take advantage of having that break. If you've not got like a certain competition coming up that you need to maintain a certain amount of training load for, just enjoy your holiday. Even if you did have competition and it's like six weeks away, you're okay just managing your training loads of that week. Have it as a deload week. Do minimal work and then manage your training load as you go back into your normal training camp. Let's say if you're going for a longer holiday, you're wanting to keep on top of your training, now, this is something that you need to manage a little bit more if you want to try and maintain your strength and fitness levels. This is something that I've actually just recently done because I've just been out to Australia for an extended amount of time. And the last thing that I wanted to do is drop off that training. So what I did was do runs. I did tempo runs outside. I did red zone runs, but like have a set pace that I need to target. So using my Apple Watch or using my phone to help monitor speed to make sure that I'm hitting the right amount of speed to get some red zone adaptations rather than just running aimlessly. Also doing some body weight workouts, band workouts as well, doing that minimum work to just get the body moving. And also just like locating some gyms, whether it's picking out a hotel with a gym in it or looking at like where a local gym is. So spend a little bit more to pay for day passes, but I kind of was accepting of that because I was thinking, right, I just want to keep on top of my training as much as I can. So when you're going into these gyms, they might not have the same amount of equipment that you used to. So that might limit the amount of exercises that you do normally. So let's say if the house hasn't got a trap bar, you're not going to be able to do a trap bar deadlift. He hasn't got a squat rack and a barbell, you're not going to be able to do back squat. The terminology that we use at Boxing Science is train that adaptation, not the exercise. So we try and find the best way to promote an adaptation rather than, than going, right, this guy needs to do a trap bar deadlift and that's in every single program. If that's not going to be ideal for that person based on their movement patterns, their training goals, or their training facilities, we're going to find something different to still promote that adaptation. So with that in mind, I still stick to our six pillars of strength training, which is squat, hinge, push, pull, single leg, and then core. Whatever training environment that I'm in, whether it's for myself or whether it's for an athlete, I still follow this six pillar approach to make sure that we're doing an exercise that fits in each category. That means that the boxing science training methods can be applied to any single training environment. Another way to train when on holiday, you can do body weight red zone circuits. It's got a range of different circuits, part of our red zone circuit program, which can be done anywhere and at any time. And they're very quick and easy to do. So if you've only got 20 or 30 minutes to train, these red zone circuits are ideal for you. Check out the link in the description. And you can also use the discount code BOXINGSCIENCE50 to get 50% off 
this program. Okay, guys, so that's the end of this week's episode of the Boxing Science Podcast. Thank you very much for listening or watching. Whatever platform that you're on, if you can leave a like or rating, this will really help the growth of the channel. If you're not a subscriber yet, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any future content. And then if you're wanting us to answer your questions, leave them in the comment box below. And also, if you've got any suggestions about how we can do these podcast episodes, what you like about it, what you want to see that's different, leave them in the comment box below. We're wanting your feedback so we can create better content to help elevate your coaching or your training performance. So thank you very much for watching and listening to the Boxing Size Podcast. Hopefully see you on the next episode.